Since the fall of man, a war has raged between good and evil. Over the centuries, this war has distorted the truth. Now the truth is perceived as lies, and lies acknowledged as truth. To this day, the battle continues as we investigate and debate the truth behind the history and mystery of the universe. We are Paratruth Radio. Antichrist, a term used in numerous times through the New Testament, most common in the book of 1 John, yet is also referenced in the Old Testament. The term Antichrist comes from the Greek word Antichristos, which literally means instead of Christ. In 1 John, Antichrist is most commonly used to describe any person who denies Jesus. But in the book of Revelation, Though the term Antichrist is never specifically used, there are passages which directly refer to the Antichrist as being a specific single person. This person not only denies Christ, but he leads people to believe that he himself is God. Now Paratruth presents the Antichrist. The Beast of Revelation. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to Paratruth Radio. My name is Eric. And I'm Justin. Today, we have a very, very interesting topic. This is something that has come up in the media over and over and over again, especially with the things happening uh, in Israel in regards to wartime. And that topic is the Antichrist. More specifically, it's the Antichrist that is referred to in the book of Revelation. So the book of Revelation is both figurative and literal. When it comes to speaking of the beasts, two of which that are mentioned by John, it is quite descriptive. I'm going to go ahead and read the passage of Revelation 13, 1 through 10. The dragon stood on the shore of the sea, and I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads, with ten crowns on its horns, and on each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had feet like those of a bear, and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power, and his throne, and great authority. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast. People worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast. And they also worshipped the beast and asked, Who is like the beast? Who can wage war against it? The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise its authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. It was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. And it was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life. The Lamb, who is slain from the creation of the world. Whoever has ears, let them hear. If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity they will go. If anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword they will be killed. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of God's people. All right. Well, from that scripture, I mean, there's a lot of things that you can break down from that scripture, mostly the the different heads of this first beast. And a lot of the stuff that I came across in the 
research that I was doing was that the heads of this beast or the beasts that are named in the scripture are supposed to be kingdoms where mm-hmm. the Antichrist is supposed to reign. And um, through your research, did you ever find where it was saying that these kingdoms are supposed to be? I mean, all these kingdoms are pr- pretty much in the Middle East uh, area. Uh, the, the scriptures themselves don't specifically tell us, but they use uh, figurative words to help describe what these kingdoms are. For example, the leopard, uh, the feet of the bear, uh, the lamb, all, all the different names of like the animals and stuff like that, the lion, they all represent certain kingdoms. In particular, with the seven heads, through all of the theology that there is about the book of Revelation, everyone interprets it differently, uh, all of which is pretty much similar. Just there's there's minor differences, you know. Mm-hmm. But the seven heads of the beast in this particular instance, uh, from what I've come across and what I'm going to go ahead and mention here, because I, I find that these are the most similar and most common amongst all of the views. The, the first head is basically Babylon. The mm-hmm. second is Persia. The third is Greece. The fourth is Turkey. The fifth is Syria. The sixth one is Egypt. And the seventh is Rome. Now, some of these, like Babylon, for example, doesn't exist anymore. Right. Uh, you know, that was destroyed long ago. But the scriptures tell us that eventually using like the 10 horns, for example, that these kingdoms, especially those that have already fallen, will rise up again in the end times. And some believe that Rome is pretty much going to be the head of all of it. Uh, Rome is often seen as, or the Roman Empire, I should say, is often seen as basically the true kingdom of the Antichrist. Because Rome, even back in John's time, was just, you know, a horrific, horrific kingdom to be a part of and to be, you know, to dwell in. And we, Rome was actually the kingdom that killed Jesus or allowed the Jews to kill Jesus. Right. And there's just so much paganism that happens there. So much daughtry, so much idolatry, so much evil that even in scripture, uh, in particular, Daniel, the book of Daniel, uh, I believe it's the second chapter talks about the uh, Rome being the most feared of all the kingdoms that are listed. It's kind of funny though, too, that even though there's a lot of things going on with uh, the Catholic religion, I mean, that's where Catholicism is seated as well is mm-hmm. in Rome. Um, Vatican city is in the heart of Rome. So it's kind of interesting to hear that, you know, that's where the seat of the Antichrist is, as well as Catholicism. Right. Well, and this is interesting because just was it, was it last week? I think we were discussing it. I can't remember when exactly we discussed it. But what's interesting is just a couple of weeks ago, we were discussing in our voodoo episode how the Pope actually considered voodoo to be uh, in coexistence with the Catholic faith. Oh, right. Because you know, as we know, voodoo, especially American voodoo, now incorporates the Catholic religion. And because of that, because, you know, voodoo seems to, I guess, glorify God and, you know, call on Jesus and pray to the saints and so on and so forth, that suddenly, even though that's false, by the way, the Catholic faith is willing to allow the Pope is willing to allow this coexistence amongst the Christians. And that is something that God is very specific on us not to do uh, with our faith. We are not to coexist with anyone other than other Christians. And so I can see why possibly the Roman empire and in particular, the Pope possibly at some point, whichever Pope it is could become the antichrist because they do have the most authority on the planet. And that's honestly, that's the sad part is the 
the Pope is actually the most powerful person in the world, where you would think the world leaders are running things. Yes, they are running the countries, but a lot of the countries, even in uh, before recent times, would always turn to the Pope or the, the Catholic faith to get their blessing on doing certain things before they did them. Right. All right, folks, we're going to our first break. We're going to have Eric's random fact of the day, and we will be right back. Now, Eric's random fact of the day. People today are very interested in protecting the environment. Water in particularly is perhaps the most life-sustaining element on planet Earth. But why are people so interested in protecting the oceans? Well, 10,000 shipping containers are lost at sea each year. 10% of those hold toxic chemicals which may leak into the ocean. Now, not only does that bring issues to drinking water, but it can kill a lot of the living organisms within the water as well. Fish would die. Sharks would die. Eventually, populations of fish and other sea creatures can die out, hence preventing people from finding food and ultimately putting their lives in danger. This was Eric's random fact of the day. <laughs> All right, folks, welcome back to Paratruth Radio. My name's Justin. And I'm Eric. And we've been talking about the Antichrist. Eric went over the first part of the scripture where it talks about the what is it? Seven heads? Talks, he talks about the first beast coming out of the water. Uh, the beast that has seven. <laughs> the beast that has seven heads like a leopard, uh, a mouth like lions, feet like a bear. Uh, and we discussed about how these heads, these seven heads, represent particular kingdoms um, or, or states, if you will, that will eventually oppress uh, God's people. All right, well, why don't we go over the next part of that scripture that actually describes the second beast? All righty. Revelation chapter 13, verse 11 to 18. John speaks and says, Then I saw a second beast coming out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. It exercised all the authority of the first beef on its behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, whose fatal wound had been healed. And it performed great signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to the earth in full view of the people. Because of the signs it was given power to perform on behalf of the first beast, it deceived the inhabitants of the earth. It ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. The second beast was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast, so that the image could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. It also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads, so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast, or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom, that the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. The number is 666. And Do even you, people uh, who don't know a whole lot about the Antichrist know at least the 666 part. 666 is often very common within horror films today. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's just the huge representation of some demonic evil entity, uh, whether it be spiritual, either here or in movies, but most in particular, when it comes to a human being, the Antichrist. You know, one thing that we've noticed, or I've noticed, I'm sure you have too, even with all the ghost hunting shows, sometimes you'll hear numbers like 666 or you'll hear knocks like 
mm-hmm. you know, in threes, there'd be writings in some places that are scratched into the walls with the number 666. And all of these things are, are very interesting because the three knocks, for example, the three scratches that people receive uh, from demonic entities when they're uh, afflicted by them is all a representation of the Trinity in a sense. It's to mock the Trinity. Mm-hmm. And in the book of Revelation, as we just read through that passage, Satan is building his own Trinity, the anti Trinity, if you will, because just in just like in uh, the Gospels, we learn about the Trinity. We learn about God, the Father, God, the Son and God, the Holy Spirit. And that is, of course, the Lord, the Father up in heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ, who came to earth and died for our sins. And then, of course, the Holy Spirit, who fills every single believer who comes to faith in Jesus Christ. And so the same thing as we just read here, something similar is going to be happening. We have the dragon, which is Satan himself. We have the first beast, which is the Antichrist. And of course, this gets a little weird because it seems there's two Antichrists here, which there are. Both of them are earth dwellers, it seems. Uh, And then, of course, we have the false prophet. So we have three there that are pretty much a representation or the reverse of the Trinity, the Holy Trinity. But could all three of those be the same person? In this particular instance, no. Uh, Satan is incapable of being in more than one place at any given time, where God, he is in a sense, three personalities, uh, if that makes any sense to anybody. It, it doesn't to me. It's hard to yeah. understand. Uh, but basically, God is one in three, just as three are in one. <laughs> so God, as a whole, is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They are all God. They are all one God. But they have separate personalities, meaning each one has works in uh Certain times, if you will, like God, the father worked through the entire Old Testament. Uh, Jesus worked through the Gospels and now the Holy Spirit works with us now today. But the same power is manifested through all of them because the Holy Spirit is still Father God. Jesus still is Father God and Father God is Jesus and the Holy Spirit. I know that sounds really confusing. It is. It's not something we're meant to fully get and we won't ever get until we go to heaven. And then the scripture tells us we will see and God will tell us everything and help us understand. The A lot of the people don't understand, too, that a lot of the Bible is both figurative and literal, as you said. Mm-hmm. It's hard to really break it down and as you were just talking about the just that particular thing of God being a Trinity. It's it's hard to interpret everything that it's it's supposed to be saying to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. It's very difficult. But Satan, as we learn through the scriptures, and you know, just something that we learn in theology, all demons, all spirits whether you believe in human spirits walking on earth or you believe simply in demons like I do walking the earth, I mean, they are incapable completely of being omnipotent, omniscient, and in this case, omnipresent. It, in the scriptures, only God is known as being having all three of those characteristics. Satan In a sense, he's kind of like us, just like we can only be in one place at any given time. Same thing with him. That's why he has so many demons, an army, a legion of demons out in the world doing his work for him because he can't be in one place at one time. As far as I'm concerned and can tell, these three entities in the Bible, the dragon, the first beast, the second beast, they're all going to be separate. But they will be linked by similarities, such as the fact that they will oppose Jesus Christ. And and that's just my personal view. You know, other people believe that God will allow Satan to have the ability to split his spirit 
for a given time amongst these other two. And of course, you know, is it possible? I'm going to say, I mean, personally, I don't think so, but with God, it's, anything's possible, you know, and God allows certain things to happen. As we see, according to the book of Job, Satan himself goes to God and asks if he can afflict Job. And God is so confident in Job being the man of God that he knew he was, that he allowed Satan to do it because Satan wanted to prove to God at that moment in the book of Job that Job himself, the moment disaster strikes, he would give up on God and turn his back. And God said, well, I'll allow you to go down there and do that. And then you'll learn that Job is the most faithful man on earth today and that he'll never turn his back on me. And that's exactly what happened. He never turned his back and Satan ultimately was defeated at at that particular point with that story. As we've said before, I mean, a lot of people always ask, well, why does God allow these things? Well, God allows these things for us to not only learn a lesson, but also to keep our faith in him because without him, it would be much worse than Mm -hmm. what it is that's going, that you're going through just to name a few people that supposedly were the antichrist or are considered a type of antichrist. Uh, we've got Antichius Epiphanes who was one of the only few pre-Christ candidates and uh, described by scholars as being as a type of Antichrist. Epiphanes was predicted by Daniel the prophet, and he fulfilled many of the prophecies that the real Antichrist will repeat. Uh, We've got the Roman Emperor Nero, the Pope, as we mentioned earlier, Charlemagne, Napoleon, Alistair Crawley, which is an interesting one because they did actually call him the Beast and 666, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Benito Mussolini, Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, which was actually the the trinity of World War II, Mm -hmm. Francisco Franco, John F. Kennedy, which I didn't understand until I read the thing, which was basically that he had received 666 votes. Ah, okay. Henry Kissinger, King Juan Carlos of Spain, Ayatollah Khomeini, Ronald Wilson Reagan, and they're saying Ronald Reagan because during the 80s when he was president, there was talk going around about the fact that he had six letters in all three of his names. Interesting. Mikhail Gorbachev, Maitreya which I didn't know who this was, but it apparently is a New Age person. Sun Mayung Moon, Yasser Arafat, Louis Farrakhan, Carl Hatzberg, William Jefferson Clinton. Of course, Bill had to be put in there somehow. Of course. And apparently... There have been people that have emailed this person that wrote this list saying Clinton is Satan's pet. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Barney the dinosaur, because he's supposed to represent the dragon. Okay, yeah. Uh, Purple and green. (laughs) Yeah. Bill Gates, Prince Charles of Wales, Jacques Chirac. Uh, I guess Jacques Chirac is the French president And it says he has been involved in a flurry of diplomatic activity. His high profile has caught the attention of several prophecy watchers. And, of course, everybody's favorite, Barack Obama. A lot of things have been going around about Barack Obama being the Antichrist. Uh, What this says here is uh, our 44th president generated a great deal of interest in what possible connections he may have to Bible prophecy. I've received dozens of emails pointing out to the odd fact that the day after the elections, the daily pick three lottery number in Obama's home state of Illinois was 666. A lot of there's a lot of other theories going on about why they feel Barack Obama is the Antichrist. But, I mean, every president that has done things 
off the wall people have said well no he's the antichrist which i understand you know they're just trying to put blame on somebody for being i don't know dumb but uh some things kind of make sense with barack obama one of which is he is said that he's trying to turn the u.s into a muslim country which in a sense i get what people are saying because he's trying to say that you know it's okay to be muslim it's okay to denounce christianity a couple of other statements he's made um also too and this is something that kind of caught my attention was barack obama is actually trying to go for a third term Mm -hmm. he has been trying to unify this country in like his insurance bill that he had passed for insurance, medical insurance, Mm -hmm. as well as, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that believe that he's trying to bring about the new world order and the new world order. If you guys don't know, is actually a kind of a conspiracy theory that there are people working behind the scenes, trying to unite the unite all countries under one world government. Hmm. Oh, that, that's pretty interesting. And, you know, over the years, I can see certain things that he's done that would be considered almost like an antichrist type of deal, if you will. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't really know. I don't I'm not out to guess and judge who's the antichrist, who's not. I know where my faith stands and I know that regardless of who is and what happens, as long as I don't do not deny Jesus, you know, I'll always have salvation and God will always be there. The one thing that's interesting, though, because now that since Barack Obama has come up here and I'm sure there's a lot of people listening who either agree with us or disagree with us yeah. or are just like, this is interesting. <laughs> um, there's a pastor by the name of uh, Saeed Abedini. He he's Iranian, but he is a uh, an American citizen. His family, his wife and his two children live here in America don't quote me on this. I think it, in Illinois, I think he, after they left, I ran, I don't know who, someone in Iran contacted him asking him if he can come back and help them build schools. And of course he being who he was said, yes. And so he went back and pretty much the moment he got there, he was arrested for being a Christian. Jeez. Yeah. He's been in prison for a little over two years now, I think going on three he is severely ill. He's constantly beaten. He has numerous infections. Um, for a while, Iranian people would not take care of him. The, the doctors will not go in and talk to him or see him because in their faith, it is unclean to touch a Christian. Therefore, they let him just suffer. Now, eventually, due to work amongst certain people, uh, who have had petitions signed. I have signed petitions many, many, many times, and I couldn't continue to sign the same petition today. Eventually, they got met, got him medical attention. You know, I ran, eventually he said, okay, they put him in a hospital for, I think, a week or two, took care of him, but he's back in prison again. <laughs> now, the one thing we're trying to do is get Barack Obama to free him and I think two or three other American Christians who are currently in imprisonment Um, or in prison in Iran. And every time it seems we're a step closer, Obama or the government in general pushes us aside, you know, and says, "Eh, no. Now, this is the thing. As we all know, Barack Obama is currently in the works of passing, I don't know what you say, passing a bill or basically allowing Iran to have access to nuclear weapons Nuclear, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Technology. Yeah, nuclear technology, uh, which we all know what what can happen there, obviously. Right. And so we're saying, you know, in our petition now, and not my petition, but you know, the petition of these people that I have signed, mm-hmm. uh, they're 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 asking Obama, like, hey, when you do this deal, make this deal to give them the nuke stuff. Part of the deal should be that they release Saeed Abedini. And these three other Christians. And so far, they keep pushing it aside and 
you know, they say yes one moment, then the next moment they say no, they're not going to do it. And I know the people, the, the people who run this particular organization, they've been to the White House. They've talked to Barack Obama one on one numerous occasions. Uh, they've gone overseas and talked to people. They're, they're trying to get other governments and kingdoms in on this, which they're being supported by other countries. But yet Obama still refuses to even bring up Saeed Abedini's freedom in the meeting that he has had and is going to have uh, with Iran. So that's very interesting because we were told in the Bible that the Antichrist is going to oppress the Christians. They're going to oppress, he's going to oppress the people of faith. And I don't know. I mean, if it was me, I think being an American president, being an American leader, knowing that there's other Americans trapped somewhere, held hostage due to their faith, we being a, a, a uh, country of freedom, you know, and particularly religious freedom, I would go out of the way and say, look, you're not getting this deal unless you let my people go, if you will. To use Moses. Yes. <laughs> Boom. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, and it's just it's interesting. It's very interesting. Does that, does that mean that he is the Antichrist? No. Does that mean he is a Antichrist? Maybe. Right. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know. But there are obvious connections here to the scriptures. The Bible tells us that in the end times, we're going to see signs. And we are seeing those signs. We're seeing countries converge and move on to or move into Israel, you know, trying to s- destroy them and take over their country. Uh, there, there's countries that are uniting against them. And what's interesting is Israel, for as long as they've been around, have very, very rarely ever lost any battle or, ro- or war. And I was actually watching something several years ago. It was a uh, news network talking about Israel and the war that was going on there. Mm-hmm. And of course, this isn't this was not a Christian news network, you know, normal. Uh, I don't know what you would call it, but just a normal network. And the one thing that the guy said who was talking was like, we have to remember that even though all these places are converging onto onto Israel, Israel has one thing that they don't have. And that's the God of the Bible on their side, the creator. And it just blew me away hearing that, like, here's someone who maybe he's a Christian, maybe he's not. Right. But he's pointing out the truth. God has always protected his people. And in the Bible, it says that it'll come very close to these countries destroying Israel, but God will not allow it to happen. And at that moment, Jesus will come down in all his glory and just end it all. Basically slay all the evil and then renew everything for his people. It's a very, very, very interesting stuff. That's actually, I, I, I've never heard of that, that particular news broadcast before. Yeah. I think we should take our next little break and uh, listen to Justin's Paranormal Headlines. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. And now, Paratruth Radio's Paranormal Headlines. Hey, pair fans. Justin here with your Paranormal Headlines. Apocalyptic sounds heard all over the world. People from several different countries have been reporting strange trumpet blasts coming from the sky. The peculiar phenomenon, which was first reported back in 2008, is still no closer to being solved and continues to be heard in the United States as well as in Germany, Canada, and elsewhere. The sound, which seems to erupt from nowhere, resembles what you might hear if all the instruments in the brass section of an orchestra were to be played together at the same time. In many cases, the noise has been described as deafening. On the morning of August 29, 2013, at approximately 7.30 a.m., I was awoken by these sounds, said Kimberly Wookie, a witness from Canada, who managed to record the strange din on multiple occasions from her house in British Columbia. I shot out of bed realizing it was the same sounds I had heard before and ran looking for a camera to try to capture them with. I have no idea what these sounds are. Another prominent incident took place in the Ukrainian capital, Kiev, in August 2011. 
The sound was extremely loud, with some people 30 to 40 kilometers from the recording also hearing it in other cities, said one witness. It was in the news with the investigation with specialists and scientists, but there is still no exact explanation. The sound was also heard in Montana in February 2012 by Aaron Trailer and his family. I've had vivid b- nightmares ever since. I posted the very eerie, strange sounds that has Missoula t- talking and s- looking towards the sky. Awful, awful nightmares, he said. My wife woke me from a dream last night where she says I was screaming like she's never heard me scream before. Some scientists believe that the phenomenon may have a geological origin. Spiders rain down from the sky over Australia. A unique phenomenon has seen parts of the country covered in glistening layer of silvery webbing. As if Australia's menagerie of terrifying spiders wasn't enough of a problem already for arachnophobes, Residents of Goulburn this month have seen their houses and gardens covered in reams of spider silk that has been raining down from the sky. Sometimes referred to as angel hair, these silvery strands appear when millions of tiny spiders migrate at the same time using a technique known as ballooning, which involves shooting a web into the air and then hitching a ride as the wind carries it along. The whole place was covered in these little black spiderlings, and when looked up at the sun, it was like this tunnel of webs going up for a couple of hundred meters into the sky, said Ian Watson, a local resident who noted that his house now looked like it had been taken over by the creatures. While ballooning is actually quite a common thing for spiders to do, scientists believe that in this case, several million of them had been attempting to migrate all at the same time. This is going on all around us all the time. We just don't notice it, said entomologist Rick Vetter. Even in Antarctica, they regularly turn up but just die. That's also why the first land animals to arrive on new islands formed by volcanic activity are usually spiders. This was a segment of Parachute Radio's Paranormal Headlines. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Parachute Radio. My name is Eric. And I'm Justin. We were just talking about the Antichrist. If you're just joining us today, shame on you. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I I mean, you guys should have been listening weeks ago, months ago. (laughs) No, no, no. If you're just joining us now, uh, I suggest stopping the player, waiting until the show's over, and then replaying the player and that way you can hear everything uh the whole story because honestly you're a little behind Um, (laughs) and it's going to take some time to catch up here it's it's been a good episode a really good episode so far Uh, we've had plenty of great discussion about the antichrist according to the book of revelation uh we had mentioned what the seven heads of the first beast of revelation uh in the that is revelation chapter 13 verses 1 through 10 what those seven heads represented we've also discussed the possible antichrists in the past a list of them one including Aleister Crowley uh, also Bill Clinton Barack Obama uh, Hitler some of the list was pretty obvious as to why they were considered antichrists other ones not sure where they're coming from well that's what the guy said too like some of them were obvious some of them were just so off the wall but he still had to include them because <laughs> it was just so off the wall it almost made sense so to speak right right well you know we've gone this far and the one thing there are a couple things we haven't discussed here that i would like to discuss okay. um what's that i said okay okay um <clears throat> the first thing is the 10 horns of the first beast now in the book of revelation the first beast says or the book of revelation says that the first beast has seven heads ten horns and i believe ten crowns yeah um, i believe that's mistaken and we mentioned what those ten horns were or ten heads or seven heads were oh my goodness (laughs) 
Numerology. <laughs> ah. <laughs> um, so we mentioned what those seven heads were, uh, and they were or represent Babylon, Persia, Greece, Turkey, Syria, Egypt, and Rome. These seven heads are basically going to be the leaders, the, the major players, if you will, um, in at the time of Revelation, at the end times of the world and of history, for that matter. The ten horns with the ten crowns also represent kingdoms, just as the heads do. Uh, those kingdoms are kingdoms that are currently in existence today, because we know that Babylon, for example, is has fallen. Babylon's been gone for a long time, yeah, thousands of years. And so the ten horns represent the kingdoms of today, the kingdoms on the hill or on the mountains, as it mentions in the scriptures. And these ten horns with the crowns are not only the kingdoms that the Antichrist would own, if you will, but the kings of which would help bring everything together for the Antichrist, would help converge uh, into a single nation almost. And, And I'm just saying that. I'm not saying that's what scripture says. I'm just saying that. And of ultimately oppress and afflict the Jesus believing people. And so these 10 horns are, and that is the kingdoms are Britain, France, Spain, Italy, Germany, Greece, Turkey, Syria, Egypt, Iraq. And there's actually an 11th one and the 11th one, even though it's not mentioned, some believe that there's a, an 11th horn, which would be the human Antichrist, because the first 10 are the kingdoms of the Antichrist. The 11th one would be the person, and that is Iran. Now, we're not saying that the Antichrist is going to come from Iran, but would come from somewhere in this list. It's very interesting, you know, and then when you think about it, Britain, France, you know, in particular, they've both helped America in the past. Yep. Uh, you know, it's happened. It, they've helped today as well. Uh, Iraq, we fought against them. Iran, you know, so on and so forth. And, you know, in the book of Revelation, I believe it's the book of Revelation. Don't quote me on this. I did the research on this particular part because I just thought about it. There is an image of an eagle. Yeah, um, there is one. An image of an eagle that is going to oppress the people, I believe. I think that's what it's said. And many people thought that that would be the eagle represents the United States because the eagle is our, you know, our, our country bird, if you will. Mm-hmm. It's our symbol. And so people would think that the president, in this case, Barack Obama or any future president or past president would be the Antichrist. But in reality, it it does not mean the United States. In fact, the United States, even though it might play a role somewhere down the line here, isn't significant overall, I don't think. But the eagle actually represents Rome because the Roman Empire had an eagle as its symbol thousands of years ago. Uh, and I don't know if it's still their symbol today or not. I have no idea. You know, it, it's that's just a slight misconception, I think, that I've commonly found people making is that this eagle represents America, when in reality, it's the Roman Empire. And as we had mentioned earlier in the show, the Roman Empire, or Rome, will be basically the big player in all of this. They'll be the one, that will be the kingdom that really reigns supreme, who really brings, I guess, the war to the Christian people, ultimately, through the person that is the Antichrist, whether it be the first beast or the second beast, which is the, the uh, false prophet. Now, very interesting stuff. The uh, other thing I wanted to mention, because I thought it's also important. One question that I, that I had years ago uh, when I first became saved after reading the book of Revelation was, why does the first beast, the one with seven heads, have one head that is fatally wounded and yet look as if it's been healed? And um, did you come across that, Justin? Actually, the the wounded part I I didn't come across in in my research. But again, oh. I I didn't read the passages either before we started, so I'm right. I'm not sure. Okay, 
So, yeah, there is one head that looks to be fatally wounded. And there are a number of different beliefs as to what this represents. Some people believe it's a particular empire that has fallen and will rise up again. Uh, that could be the Roman Empire in particular. In particular, I, I'm sorry, I have a commentary here that I use in Matthew Henry's uh, concise commentary. Matthew Henry, by the way, if you want an awesome commentary, that's going to fill you in with great information about these passages. I, I, it, <laughs> yes, I can't support it enough. I love Matthew Henry's uh, concise commentary. But one belief is that the wounding of the head may be the abolishing of pagan idolatry and the healing of the wound would be the introduction of popish idolatry in the same substance, only in a new dress, if you will. And I, I just that's quote for quote what I just read there, all of which would actually answer the devil's design. So we're saying that the pagan uh, influence that once was was destroyed by Christianity. Hence, we have, you know, uh, Roman Catholics now. Mm -hmm. But that that pagan idolatry will come back at some point in the end times. And in this case, it will come back even stronger, which is why now that we have the pagan influence and, you know, the Christian influence together will help to ultimately deceive the people of the world into believing that the Antichrist is God himself, which we all know, of course, Antichrist means he's not. Right. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you, I mean, I'm not, I don't know, but. <laughs> well, one thing that I want to ask of you because I'm starting to wonder more and more. Do you think that we will see these things coming in our lifetime? Oh, um, I can't say yes, you know, and I can't say no. The scriptures tell us very clearly that no one knows the day and time of the end. Right. Um, you know, even when Jesus was on earth, it said that he didn't even know only the father knows. And that of course is weird because we had just mentioned the Trinity and how they're all one, which means God, the father, God, the son, which is Jesus and the Holy spirit all know the exact same thing. They're all omnipresent, all omnipotent, all omniscient. Um, yet I think when Jesus became human, there were certain traits that were cut off due to the humanity, right. you know, um, and yet we see in scripture that he was omniscient, uh, at least to an extent. He can tell what people were thinking. And we say that over and over again. But in this particular instance, in regards to the end times, he didn't even know when the end times were at that moment. And well, so now it makes sense why, you know, God would not let him because he was obviously the voice of God coming down. But he couldn't let that particular thing be known because then everyone would be like, okay, well, we got to prepare for this date. Let's go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I don't think it's something where like, you know, God didn't trust. Jesus, oh no, no, no. Or anything like that. It was just something that, you know, we don't have full answers. Right. I don't know. And I know it's weird because I keep saying God and Jesus. And yet scripture tells us that God and Jesus are one and the same. So it's weird that God, the father, and God the Son is God the Father, and God the Father is God the Son. Is the <laughs> um, often well, Jesus would pray to heaven, and in a sense, he'd be praying to himself because he is God. But when he became human, uh, there was this slight separation where God took a piece of himself, if you right. will. Just like when sense. God created man, he yeah. created it, Jesus. Uh, well, no, he not exactly. That, that's the big difference. Jesus was never created like man is created. Oh, well, right. Always existed, but they always existed as one. So what God did was basically just take a part of himself. I'm like humans, like God breathed the spirit into humans to give them life. That's it. It wasn't necessarily God himself right. going into humans, you know, but God himself took a piece of himself and sent himself to earth as the name and form of Jesus. So that you can, you know, there's some kind of slight separation for people on earth and yet 100% fully the same person uh, as in heaven. Uh, yeah, I know my mind's going right, getting yeah. rattled right now. <laughs> Jeez, <laughs> Louise, what? what am I saying? I don't even, oh. 
<laughs> well, and and that's, I mean, again, that's why a lot of people get confused when reading the Bible. They they don't understand it. Yeah. And, you know, I'm not a pastor. So if anyone has true questions, you know, real questions as to what exactly Trinity is and how that all works out, I would talk to a pastor, talk to a Christian pastor, you know, obviously. Um, and I guarantee they would be more than happy to help you understand that a little bit more. You'll never fully understand it. But it might give you a little bit of peace of mind, you know, to have some kind of understanding. Like me, I understand it, but I can't easily explain it fully, you know, um, only by the way that I've already done it, which just raises more questions. Yeah. So those are the two things I wanted to cover, though, real quick was the uh, the ten horns and ten uh, crowns, as well as the wounded head, which, by the way, I'd never finished because we rabbit trailed as yep, always, as always. So it could be this pagan, you know, idea that it was destroyed and then we'll come back. Another possibility is that, as in the beginning, a, a scripture in the book of Genesis, I believe it's chapter chapter three, says that uh, says to Satan, God says to Satan that he's going to put an enmity between the woman and Satan, and that that enmity, that Satan will strike the foot or the heel of the enmity and the enmity will stomp on his head, crush his head. And that's basically the enmity is basically Jesus. Basically it is Jesus. The woman is the people, God's people of the earth and the serpent is Satan. And we saw all of that come to pass already because when Jesus was here, Satan nipped at his heel, killed Jesus but on knowing, or probably knowing, but unwilling to understand uh, on Satan's part, Jesus didn't stay dead. He brought himself back to life and continues to live. And when he came back to life, that was when he crushed Satan's head or the serpent's head. It was a fatal blow, one that Satan was not ready for because Satan wanted to prevent at all costs um, God coming to save the people of earth. And when Jesus died, Satan for a moment had a celebration that he had succeeded. But three days later, when Jesus came back, Satan was astounded that suddenly the veil had torn and people have 100% complete communication with God himself and needs no one in between. You know, we don't, uh, the Catholic Catholicism in particular, you need to go to a priest in order to confess your sins. And then the priest will, you know, give you prayers or whatever um, in order for, for that forgiveness. But the priest acts as that person between you and God, you know, because the priest seems to be higher than you because he's a priest, he's a man of God, only he can go to the Father, which is often seen in the Old Testament. But when Jesus died and rose again, it allows us to go straight to the Father. We no longer need to confess our sins to another human being. We confess them to God himself, and God will hear us, God will listen, and God will respond. Um, and that's when the blow came to Satan's head. And that's one possibility as to why this beast that comes out of the sea has a fatal wound on one of his heads that seemed to have healed. Because just as he was destroyed then and defeated, he comes back in the end, you know, he comes back in a sense and starts tearing the world apart, trying to destroy what God created. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, you know, maybe he really does die and come back. Maybe God allows that. On the other hand, maybe it's just a way to make people think that he's that he's himself is Christ, that he himself is God. Uh, it, it's all a huge illusion. Mm -hmm. It looks as if he died and came back, but in reality, he never once died. He's always been, you know, Satan mm -hmm. I'm talking about, uh, or the Antichrist. So that, that those are the two big, big theories out there. No one really knows for sure what it is, uh, what this fatal wound is, or what it represents. It could be 100% completely figurative. It could be a literal meaning in some sense. The truth is we won't fully know until the time comes. And that's what most people don't get is they're looking for answers from their their church as to when this is going to happen or explain why it's going to happen. And I mean, most people know why. I mean, God needs to cleanse the earth. 
Mm-hmm. But they, they, the the church, the people of the church don't have any more answers than you do, folks. They they know it is coming. They just don't know when. And all they're trying to do is prepare you for it. Mm -hmm. The one thing that I just have to say real quick to put it out there, you know, so many people, uh, myself included, at one point believed that, you know, they think, oh, well, you know, I believe Jesus exists, but. I'm not going to turn to him. I'm not going to accept him. I'll wait until the last moment <laughs> and then I'll do it. Yeah. You know? Because the scripture says that once you believe that's it, your salvation's secure, locked up. You can never lose it. You'll end up in heaven. But God said that the end times will come like a thief in the night. It'll break in when you don't know it. And as soon as it happens, that's it. The door is locked. The windows are locked. Everything is, you know, locked up and you're shut out, which means when the time comes, you could try to turn to God, but he won't hear you. You know, it is just a point in time where whoever's left who did not choose Christ suffers. And it's a harsh, harsh, harsh reality, but it's the truth. And so, you know, if you're on the edge, you know, if you, you're thinking, you know, maybe Maybe I should turn to Jesus. Maybe I should ask him for salvation. You know, maybe I should, you know, get on my knees for once and just pray that he helped me. Do it sooner than later. Do it now. Do it before it's too late. Because when it is, then it is. All right, folks, that is all we got for you tonight. And uh, next week we've got another great uh, thing going on so uh join us next week same time same channel right here at paratruthradio.com as well as spreaker.com and uh, we will talk to you guys next week i'm justin and i'm eric have a good night folks peace if you enjoyed listening to this episode of paratruth radio then tune in to paratruthradio.com where you can click on the Listen Live tab and listen to tonight's episode again or any of our other past episodes. Also, you can check us out at Spreaker.com forward slash Paratruth Radio as well as YouTube.com forward slash Paratruth Radio where again, you will find all of our previously recorded shows as well as video trailers for previous and upcoming episodes. Thank you.